This is Jacqueline Novogratz, and um, this is the first of 15 days when I will be doing readings on um, Facebook Live of my new book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, that just came out uh, today. And um, in many ways, this book is the culmination of a life's work, uh, 35 years of trying to uh, make change in the world and 35 years ultimately of investing in and accompanying uh, individuals who've dared to make change themselves. Um, I think I wrote it as a love letter to anyone who wants to create change in this flawed and fragile but beautiful world. And ironically, it's coming out at a funny time during the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, yet nothing, if not this virus, has shown us that if we do not create a world um, built on a moral framework, it won't be good for any of us. We've so lost trust in our institutions. We know that many of them have run their course, but we have not imagined what should replace them. This book, learning from so many of my teachers of all races, classes, nations, ethnicities, and tribes over the course of my lifetime, have shown that if we flip the model, if we start with the poor, the vulnerable, the earth, and put that in the center of our systems rather than profit alone, we would really have a chance to regain that trust, to rediscover ourselves as we build a, wo a world in which all of us can contribute. So for the next 15 days, I am going to read excerpts from each of the chapters in the, in the book. Um, and I'm going to start with the introduction and read the whole thing so that you get a real sense of what it means and how we go. So here goes, introduction, 1986, Kigali, Rwanda. I am standing in a field on a blue sky day, surrounded by tall yellow sunflowers. I am a 25 year old banker, dressed in a flowy skirt, wearing flat mud speckled white shoes, my head filled with dreams of changing the world. Beside me is an apple cheeked, bespectacled nun in a brown habit, smiling broadly. Her name is Fedicula, and I adore her for taking me under her wing. Along with a few other Rwandan women, she and I are planning to build the first microfinance bank in the country. Today, we're visiting a sunflower oil pressing business, the kind of tiny venture our bank might one day support. We plan to call the microfinance organization Duterembre, meaning to go forward with enthusiasm. All I see is upside. 2016, Kigali, Rwanda. I am standing at an outdoor reception on a starry night, surrounded by men and women in dark suits. I am the 55-year-old CEO of Acumen, a global nonprofit seeking to change the way the world tackles poverty. Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, and his top ministers are at the reception to meet potential investors in a new $70 million impact fund Acumen is bringing to bring solar electricity to more than 10 million low-income people in East Africa. I have become all too familiar with the risks of making and then trying to deliver on big promises. Yet I'm confident Acumen and its partners can launch and implement this fund and thus prove the power of innovation to help solve one of the continent's most intractable problems. Just before I begin to make a formal presentation to the group, a young Rwandan woman wearing a navy suit and low-heeled pumps approaches me. Miss Novogratz, she says, I think you knew my auntie. Really, I ask, what's her name? I haven't a clue to whom she is referring. Too many of my friends were murdered in the genocide. Her name was Felicula, she responds brightly. My eyes welled with tears. I'm sorry, I stammer. Would you remind me who you are again? My name is Monique, the young woman answers with soft-spoken confidence, her eyes holding mine, 
I am the Deputy Secretary General of Rwanda's Central Bank. Words fail me completely. I am transported back to the days when Felicula and I dreamed together of a world in which women would have greater control over their lives. Of course, we started with a low bar. Until 1986, it was illegal in Rwanda for a woman to open a bank account without her husband's permission. Although Felicula and I and our other co-founders had big dreams to make a difference, had you told us in 1986 that within a generation I would be standing before a young Rwandan woman with overseeing her nation's financial system, I'm not sure we would have believed you. In addition to being an enterprising nun, Felicula Yarataram Birwa, along with two other co-founders of Duterembere, was among the first three women parliamentarians in Rwandan history. Early in their parliamentary tenures, while Duterembere was just getting started, the three women felt compelled to take on the issue of bride price, a system whereby men presented three cows to a potential father-in-law in exchange for marrying his daughter. Felicula especially respected the power of tradition, but not as an excuse for reducing women to chattel. The bill to ban the payment of bride price passed easily, but a backlash erupted. Rural women felt diminished. In their eyes, their economic value had been decimated overnight. Women and men across the country raised their voices in protest and many parliamentarians blamed the outcry on the rashness of their freshman colleagues. The women parliamentarians had failed to understand the depth of cultural practices in their own nation. They focused on what could be, but neglected to recognize the world that was, including the high stakes realities of politics. In 1987, just a few days after the bride price fiasco, Felicula was killed in a mysterious hit and run accident. Some assumed it was a government orchestrated killing. The murder was never found. I mourned Felicula and grieved over losing a person who gave me a sense of belonging without consideration of my tribe or religion or ethnicity. But if I had lost a chunk of my innocence with her death, I also had learned the folly and danger of unbridled optimism not grounded in the realities of the communities we wish to serve. I grew in understanding, and thanks to the elemental work contributed by Felicula and others, our microfinance bank expanded, reaching borrowers not only in Kigali, but across the nation. Then in 1994, the Rwandan genocide ripped the country apart, resulting in the slaughter of more than a half million people, mostly from the minority Tutsi tribe. Shockingly, one of the co-founders of our beloved institution of social justice emerged as a leader of that horrendous bloodbath. After that, I couldn't help but question all those platitudes I'd heard about women being more nurturing and caring than men. Some women, I thought, not all women. Yet soon enough, like shoots of fragile flowers creeping upward through granite cracks, a small group of women leaders came across, came together from across the country to put Duterembre back together again. The quiet, resolute actions of these women who had lost everything but hope, rekindled their resilience and helped repair the nation's broken heart. 30 years later, not only is Duterembre surviving, but it is thriving and continuing to play its part in Rwanda's remarkable recovery. And though the history of the country's first three pro women parliamentarians ended tragically, Rwanda now has the highest percentage of women parliamentarians of any country on earth. Back in Kigali on that night in 2016, I reconnected with the memory of Felicula, who had started work she could not complete in her lifetime. She was taken too early, but her work continued anyway, because she cared, fought fiercely for her convictions and brought others along with her. I was reminded that every one of us stands on the shoulders of those who have gone before, that every one of us 
has a chance to build on the collective knowledge of remarkable human beings, their achievements, the principles they cherished. And I was there to reassure myself that we have infinitely more knowledge, more connection, tools, skills, and resources to, cap to tackle the world's injustices today than we did back in Felicula's time or at any other time in history. The poet T.S. Eliot wrote, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. That night in Kigali, I renewed my commitment to working toward dreams so big they may not be completed in my lifetime. And I resolved to write a love letter of sorts to anyone daring to take action in our deeply flawed world. We are made from what came before. We make ourselves out of the promises that lie ahead. And we are always in the process of becoming. When I lived in Rwanda as a younger woman, cell phones, the internet and social media had yet to be invented. I listened to the news twice daily via the BBC on a shortwave radio. It was a world of separation, separate nations, religions, ethnicities, tribes, and genders. Though that world was terribly unequal and unfair, nearly 40% of humanity subsisted on less than a dollar a day. Most of us were blissfully unaware of what was happening in other parts of our own countries, let alone what was happening on the other side of the world. The revolutions in technology and globalization in the past three decades have changed everything. The rate of extreme poverty has fallen to 10% and cell phones have connected nearly every individual on the planet. We can see into each other's living rooms and gain a view into one another's lifestyles. Rights for human beings and non-humans are expanding on so many dimensions, the world has gotten better. Yet the same forces that have shaped this world, technology and shareholder capitalism, hold within them the potential to destroy us. We are dangerously unequal and divided. We collectively face the ultimatum of our climate emergency. And many of the institutions devoted ostensibly to improving the lives of the many, not the few, are broken yet we have not envisioned their replacements. We need a new narrative. We are too entangled to abide worldviews based on separation, nor can we look to simple technological or market solutions. Those stories have run their course. We will be so much richer, productive, and peaceful if we learn not only to coexist, but to flourish celebrating our differences while holding to the understanding that we are part of each other, bound together by our shared humanity. That narrative will not come from above us, but from all of us. What we need is a moral revolution, one that helps us reimagine and reform technology, business, and politics, thereby touching all aspects of our lives. By moral, I don't mean strictly adhering to established rules of authority or convention, regardless of consequence. I mean a set of principles focused on elevating our individual and collective dignity, a daily choice to serve others, not simply benefit ourselves. I mean complementing the audacity that built the world we know with a new humility, more attuned to our interdependence. Of course, the notion of moral revolution is a tall order. Some might call it naive, but I am not writing with wide-eyed idealism. Over three decades, I have fought many fights for social and economic change. Much of this time has been spent building acumen, investing in social entrepreneurs who seek to provide essential goods and services at affordable prices to people living in poverty. The work has given me a front row seat to the realities of making sustainable change in some of the most challenging places on the planet. What I've learned from these individuals has deeply inspired me and I want to pass on those lessons 
because they apply broadly. None of this is easy, of course. I have accompanied hundreds of change agents through challenges and sometimes crushing defeats. My face wears the lines of failures, losses, and far too many sleepless nights. However, hard battles do not account for all my face's creases. Some are etched from smiles and laughter shared with people who insisted on striving for freedom, opportunity, and justice against all the odds. I have partnered with good people who have changed their communities, their companies, their nations, and ultimately themselves. I have witnessed people making what others might consider hopelessly romantic dreams come true. And true not just for a few, but for millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions. The actions of these people, not their slogans or petty, pretty words, have kept alive for me the ideas of purpose, of impact, of dignity, of love, all separate points on a moral compass. A new generation is rising, one that is more conscious of how they live, what they buy, and where they work. Many are unwilling to work for companies unless those companies are committed to sustainability and recognize that with power must come accountability. And a growing number of companies are listening. I've been heartened to see some CEOs move to stakeholder models, partly in response to prompting by their younger employees and, be, and because they recognize themselves the need to change. If you are working in a corporation, you have ample opportunity to act. Cynics might point to a system of governments, corporations, and technologies so broken that attempts to change it from the edges are futile. But cynics don't build the future. Instead, they often use their jaundiced views to justify inaction. And never before have we more desperately needed their opposite, thoughtful, empathetic, resilient believers and optimists on a path of moral leadership. This book assumes that you are interested in being part of world-changing human capital that will help solve problems big and small. Maybe you are a teacher or a communicator, an activist or a doctor, a lawyer or an investor, or some new force for positive change. I have seen people like you alter the lives of school children and street children, refugees, the formerly incarcerated, of people living, living in forgotten communities and in places ravaged by war, poverty, or toxic industries. I've witnessed you not just doing, but improving the often unseen work of serving the sick, healing the heartbroken, sitting with the dying, to remind others that they too are good and worthy of love. Or you might be a philanthropist. The hard work of changing systems requires financial resources. And just as there is a new generation of entrepreneurial individuals focused on solving complex issues, so there is a new generation of philanthropists, men and women willing to give not just money, but their time, commitment, connections, and big parts of their hearts and minds. Change is the domain of all of us. In every country on earth, people are refusing to acquiesce to the exhausting, deadening news cycles filled with catast catastrophe and cynicism, seeking to make good news instead. These people are deliberately expanding their circles of compassion, reaching across lines of difference with quiet strength forged in all that we have in common. Our problems are so similar so solvable, and we are better than we think we are. Those I've known who've most changed the world exhibit a voracious curiosity, the world and other people, a willingness to listen and empathize with those unlike them. These people stand apart not because of school degrees or the size of their bank accounts, but because of their character, their willingness to build reservoirs of courage and stand for their beliefs even if they stand alone. Of course, this kind of character isn't built overnight. It is honed through a lifelong process of committing to something bigger than yourself, aspiring to qualities of moral leadership, defining success 
by how others fare because of your efforts, embedding a sense of purpose into your daily decisions. Change is possible. And because large scale sustainable change is possible, I have come to see it as a responsibility to be part of that change. When it comes to a life of making change, there are no shortcuts. It is hard work, but it is time well spent. And when you reach the other side of the difficult to see tangible transformation, it is like nothing in the world. A deep abiding sense, not just of accomplishment, but of joy. I wrote this book because I believe that our fragile, unequal, divided, yet still beautiful world deserves a radical moral rejuvenation. This revolution will ask all of us to shift our ways of thinking to connection rather than consumerism, to purpose rather than to profits, to sustainability rather than to selfishness. We must awaken to see workers not as inputs, the environment not as our personal domain, and shareholders not as all powerful. All we need to move away from old models of doing what is right for me and assuming it will turn out right for you. If you were looking for a simple how-to guide or step-by-step -step instructions for building a company or a nonprofit organization, this is not the book for you. Rather, this book is my attempt to bring forward and share the principles I have learned from thousands of change agents based above all on the value of human dignity. Each of their stories makes manifest the kind of moral leadership that looks to the future not with blind optimism, but with a hard edged hope. Each of their stories, the people whose work I describe in this book have had to learn to deal with ugly truths while singing songs of the possible. They recognize that every problem, every problem is an opportunity to act. A manifesto is a public declaration of intentions. This one is for all who hear the call of moral leadership, guiding principles to dream and build a better world, coordinates on a moral compass set by those already leading this journey of change. Hopefully, this is for you. I just thank you so much for taking the time to listen, and I um, hope to see you soon. Hope to see you tomorrow.